We are pleased to introduce Tamika Strong. Tamika Strong is a reference archivist at the Georgia Archives who has a love for sharing information. She discovered her passion for genealogy after planning a successful series of Tracing Your Family History workshops at a library where she worked. Since then, she has become more involved with genealogy by presenting several workshops at various institutions, including her alma mater, Emory University, and the Atlanta History Center. She also leads a monthly genealogy discussion group and is active in several genealogy organizations, including serving as the president of the Georgia Genealogical Society. A thrill of the hunt type of researcher, Tamika enjoys assisting others in discovering their ancestors while trying to find her own. Person who had the speech of I am somebody. Jesse Jackson, all right. So we are unique, right? So our research is unique to us and our research subjects. And so this presentation is gonna give you a general overview of places where you can search to find your research subjects. Whether you're doing family history research or if you're doing um, historian research or regular research, we wanna kinda hit all of those um, bases. And so this presentation is going to be about knowing where to look, researching African Americans in the Georgia archives. Get it set up like I want to. All right. So this is our agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about the archives. We're going to talk about getting ready. How do you prepare for research at a research institution? We're going to talk about online resources and knowing before you come. We're going to also talk about how not everything is online, print and original resources, and we're going to mention some other state resources. We are the Georgia Archives, the permanent home for government and historical documents on the state of Georgia. We are 100 years young and a unit of the University System of Georgia. Our collection is 90,000 cubic, cubic feet. Just imagine 90,000 banker boxes. And so I was happy that Tiffany earlier talked about linear feet, because even I get confused with linear feet, like what exactly is linear feet? But we'll talk about those descriptions a little bit later because sometimes you have to talk, talk archive ease to understand how you get access to these records. So our collection includes more than 90,000 cubic feet, 10,000 maps, 20,000 books and periodicals, 30,000 reels of microfilm, 100,000 photographs and over 260 million documents. We have lived in four different places. We all grew our earlier three. The first home was the state capitol. Second home, Rose Hall, which is still there, by the way. The third one was the cube at 20. We had to leave there because it was sinking and stuff was falling off the building. They said I 20 because all the vibration from the highway, because the building was there before the highway. So when the highway came in, can you imagine, y'all seen 20, y'all see how busy it is, right? So we then went to this current location in 2003. So what do we do? We help state agencies, amongst other things, we help state agencies and local governments manage their current and inactive records. And as you can see, that's one of the removable shells that we have in our four vaults four floors, four vaults, and we still have room to grow, thankfully. And so most of you are probably familiar with the research room. That's what the picture, um, part of the stacks is pictured in the uh, photograph up there. And so what we typically do is make historic records of permanent value available to the public. We assist re researchers in person by phone and email, and we also offer resources, including Ancestry Library Edition, Fold 3, we also have Han online downstairs as well. So this is a, some samples of types of records that we have available at the archives. And so how do you get ready to visit the archives? It starts at home. So before you even get to us, there's a few things you need to know. So when you come and visit us down in a research room, we're gonna ask you a couple of questions. We're gonna ask you, what do you want to accomplish today? What's your goal? So for me, it's a good idea as a researcher for me to have a long-term goal and a short-term goal. Now these goals may change over time. 
but maybe your long-term goal is to trace your paternal family back to 1870. Now, this is going to be mostly focused on family history, but who just does general research or historian research too? Okay, all right, we'll 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 talk about that too. <clears throat> but for the short term short term goal, I might want to find the census records for my paternal great grandfather. So that seems something you know simple we can accomplish in one setting. So I'm gonna have that in the back of my mind when I go into the archives. So what I'm gonna do is before I even get there, I'm gonna start looking at family home resources from home. So think about family stories, family Bibles, divorce decrees, funeral programs, whatever resources you have available at home, that's where you want to start. You even want to interview yourself because you may know more information than you think. So I had a conversation with self, like self, what do we know about so-and-so? So once you have a conversation with yourself, you want to write it all down because we're also going to ask you about names, about dates, about locations. And we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about that in a minute about how, why that's important. So when we say names, not just the person that you're looking for, you need their family names. You need their children, their siblings, their parents, if you have it, whatever information you have that's going to help us help you, that's what you need to bring along with you. How many of you have seen a chart like this? Not March Madness, but a chart like this. Okay. So this is a generation chart, an ancestor chart, ancestry chart, pedigree chart. It has multiple names. But the ultimate goal is to capture your direct ancestry. So typically you start with yourself and you work backwards. So I'm giving you a free genealogy 101 class, but we have another one tomorrow. But anyway, the first one is going to be you. And then the one on top is typically the father. The one on the bottom is the mother. And then you put all the information that you know on this chart. Now, when you come and I'm sitting there and you say, oh, I'm trying to find blah, blah, blah. We typically use this to help us to keep the people in order so that we'll know how to best help you. And so we might start by saying, I need you to fill this out. Okay. And any information you don't have, leave it blank. That will turn into a, a to-do. But also, when you list females on this chart, they're listed with their maiden name. And if you don't have it, just leave it blank. You may even be asked to do one of these if you're focusing on a family unit. And so the pedigree chart or the generation chart captures your direct ancestry. But it leaves out your siblings. So like my mom, she has a total of nine siblings. Her mother had two sets. She had three with her first husband, six with her second husband. So with the family group sheet, you're gonna have one per couple. So she would have two. One with her first husband and the three children in chronological order. The second one with her and her second husband and the six children in chronological order, okay? So one of my favorite resources is the Midwest Genealogy Center forms. And the reason why is because they are fillable forms. So all of that information that was recorded on here, when you see their chart, you'll see a lot of blue boxes. And in those blue boxes, you can type in information. So you can use that as a way of keeping track of your information. When you find new information, you update it. So if you don't remember anything else about pedigree chart, ancestor charts, visit this website and download it and play around with it because it's a great resource. All right, so this is a partial chart for my family. Starts with my grandmother, Miss Maggie Bell Printup. I think in this one, you'll probably learn a little bit more about her. So this is what a pedigree chart, generation chart looks like filled in, okay? So maybe you're starting at this point. Maybe you've done the generation chart and you have some information and you want to fill in some of that blank information. Or maybe you just know this. Maybe you just know about <clears throat> the person who um, you're researching. Can I get, I'm sorry, I'll be right back. I want to make my Yes, yes. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. So maybe you don't know much, but maybe you know about this person who is your research subject. Um, this is my great grandmother, Becky. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Bessie, who is Maggie's mother. And so this is what I know about her. So maybe this is the information that you know about your research subject. And so, or maybe you're at the point where you have your focal research subject and you have created a timeline. And this timeline for my second great grandfather on my dad's side, it shows his location for the different census records, shows he had a World War II draft card and where he was. Then it also shows an entry in 1956 where he moved to Atlanta. Now, I know he moved in between 1950 and 1956. I haven't tracked down exactly when he moved, but there is an entry there to let me know he was there. And he died in 1979. So this is a really good tool. If you're not utilizing it for your research, I would suggest and recommend that you do because you can use this not only to trace their migratory path, but if you have a woman like my grandmother who was married twice, you can make note of when her name changed. So you'll know in this time, this location, I'm looking for Maggie Crenup. At this time, this location, I'm looking for Maggie Swinger. This time, this location, I'm looking for Maggie Maddox. Y'all got You guys follow that? Yeah. All right. I'm a big believer in prep work. Yes, sir. You put it in words. <laughs> and I'm not being facetious, but this is just simply because when I sit, when we sit down with you downstairs, I will typically make this on a scrap sheet of paper. So I'll ask you the name of your research subject. Do you know their birth year and their death year? Because I actually did this with Lydia just, you know, before lunch. And so knowing what I know about records, I know that he was born 1914 and I know he died in 1979. So that's the beginning and that's the end, right? So we know that the census record comes out how many years? Every 10 years. So what's the first census? I know it's up there, but what's the first census you think this person would be born in? I mean, listed in 1920. If a person was born in 1879, what's the first census they should show up in? 1880. So depending upon the birth year and the death year, and the census records that are available now are between 1790 and what year? 1950. So 1950 is the last census record that's available. So using that information, I can then put down 1920, 1930, 1940, and 1950 as placeholders. These are the records I should be able to find him in. But because it's a male, we got the draft, right? So we got the draft, the World War I draft. We got World War II. So World War I happened in what years? 1917, 1918. So if he was of age, I will put a placeholder for that. But if he's of age in 1941, I'm going to put a placeholder for that. So you can essentially write out this skeleton. I call it a census checklist. But you, this is the beginning of a timeline. Because, of course, if you got married, I can put that in there. If you got divorced, I can put that in there. So you want to use a tool that will allow you to add information as you learn it. Okay? Good question. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Because I asked you, who do you want to find? And I try to, we, we, we try to help you work through that person. So just a note. Try to be organized and try not to have us do 50 million people because we might get frustrated because we want to work through that first person first until we exhaust the resources and then go to the other one. OK, just a note. I like order just a little bit. But maybe you have been in a game for a very long time. You know, you got 50 million surnames. You know where they are. You have an idea of the timeline. I mean, time frame. So what this is here is a surname chart. So this is useful when you're going to different locations, like say, for instance, I'm going to the Fulton County Courthouse. I want to figure out what surnames do I know of that's in Fulton County. 
I'm going to pull this chart up. I'm going to sort it to pull out only Fulton County. So that way I don't be looking for in Fulton County because they're not there. So you want to use tools, whatever works for you. The thing about genealogy, you can be pen and paper or you can have the most expensive genealogy software to do what you do. Whatever works for you, that's the goal, okay? I don't do genealogy software personally because I can see patterns better when I use tools like this and pen and paper. But whatever works for you, works for you. So all of this is prep work. And so I know we spend a lot of time on this, but it's important because we wanna be able to find the resources that may help you with your research. And in order for us to help you, we gotta know all these things. Additional considerations for research. What do you know about your Georgian or your research person? When were they in Georgia? Where did they live in Georgia? And we'll talk about why that's important. How long did they live in the state? Was it them by themselves or were they with their family members? And who were those family members or whoever it was? The race and ethnicity. What religion did they practice? Did they own land or were they a tenant? Did they have military service? The questions go on and on. But you have to know about your research subject. Tiffany touched upon it because she was like, how are they interacting with the institution? Were they in certain clubs? Did they go to the school? Because she pre presented the idea that a person called and said, I'm looking for so-and-so, but they were in Texas. You call in Atlanta to look for somebody in Texas. Did they go to the school? If they didn't, then, you know, if it was me, I would say, okay, contact the Texas State Archives, that kind of thing. So you got to think about how is your research subject interacting with these records, okay? There are three important factors when you're doing research in general. Date, location, and where to look, okay? Date is important because certain records start at certain dates. Certain records got destroyed in courthouse fires because, you know, we had a lot of them in Georgia. And you just need to know where you're looking for the individuals. We had the chart. So, you know, if I'm looking for Clemens, I'm not looking in Fulton County at a certain time. I'm looking in Jasper. But like the uh, example with Oki Collins, if I'm looking for him in 1956, I'm not going to be looking for him in Norwood, Warren County. I'm going to be looking for him in Fulton County. Okay. Location, dates of records, um, where these records house. The Georgia Archives has records for a lot of counties in the state of Georgia, some of which we do not. So you got to figure out, okay, what location. But then the other thing about location is boundary changes. And we'll see that in a little bit and where to look. We are in the digitization age. There are records that are available online now for the first time ever. And you don't have to go on site. You can just sit at home with your beverage of, of choice and look at your computer and find that record. And we can help you find that out too. So this is a general historical timeline of Georgia. Some of these are my own creations. So don't quote, if y'all say, oh, Tamika said so-and-so, that's only because Tamika said it. This has no relevance to anything else. But this is a general historical timeline but I wanted to give you one for the African-American. Did you guys know that slavery didn't start? Slavery was not a part of the colony when it started? No, slavery didn't start in Georgia till like 1751, 1750. So slavery in Georgia started in 1751, ended in 1865. We had reconstruction. We had the Jim Crow segregation era. And we had the rights fights and documentation years. And I wanted to pull that out because this is going to dictate how you research. Okay. I didn't do the slide. It's in my, it was in my head, but I didn't get a chance to do it. When you're researching African-Americans in Georgia, when you get back to 1865, that's that line. When you're on this side, 1865 to the present, you're researching a person. When you hit 1865 and they were enslaved, what are you researching? 
you're researching property. So when you're researching property, you're looking at the property what? Owner. Okay. So up to 1865, you're researching an individual. When you get past that, you're researching property. Okay. Y'all get that? Y'all understand? So when you start researching property, you have to change your methodology. You have to stop looking for that person, the Black person, and start looking at the owners, okay? Thank God it wasn't open. I'll be in trouble. All right. <laughs> records by century. So there was some records in 1700. Then we got more records in the 1800s. 1900s, it just exploded. So the later you get, the more records you will have access to. So this is the county's growth for Georgia. Georgia at one point had 161 counties, second only to Texas. But we went down to 159. Why did we go down to 159? Merged. Campbell and Milton with what county? Fulton. Huh? Yeah. So we have 159 counties right now. So if you want to see a cool map, an interactive map that shows the formation of the counties, this is a great resource, the Atlas of Historical County Boundaries, because technically your person or your family could have lived in the same spot for a hundred of years, but they could be in five different counties because the boundaries around them changed. So you have to keep that in mind when you're doing research. This is a county map of the state of Georgia. We have this on our website and it includes the, except, um, the county um, creation dates. So you can see here that such and such county started whenever, okay? The second page or the opposite side of that shows the, the courthouse disasters, record loss events. So as you can see, there are a lot of counties that had courthouse fires. Doesn't mean that they lost records, but that lets you know that they did have a courthouse fire. Yes, ma'am. It's downstairs. Um, um, I don't... So this, this one was not in Oldra. This was on the table outside of Oldra. Yeah, it's an older map, but this that's not this one. Yeah. So vital records is important when you do on family history research. Just wanted to do this slide to kind of let you know about the time frame that is missing with regards to vital records in Georgia. We started as a, col a colony in 1732. Statehood came in 1788. They attempted to do vital records in 1875, but they actually started in 1919. So you see the time frame that's missing. So there are some locations. Um, I didn't include that slide. There are some locations that have pre-1919 um, records. And so on our website, we have that form that will tell you what locations, but generally, the birth and deaths started in 1919, and death records for the state of Georgia up to 1943 are available on Family Search. And they're starting to be added to Accessory Library Edition. So anything after that, or all of the birth certificates for the most part, you have to reach out to Vital Records. So the thing about doing this research when you're dealing with African Americans is you have to know a little bit about African American history that's going to determine a lot, okay? So whatever your research location, learn about how African-Americans or whatever ethnicity your research subject is, was treated during the various time frames that you're researching. You want to know about the place. Now, we know with segregation, you have Black neighborhoods, right? So you want to figure out where are the Black neighborhoods. Black churches, they are anchor institutions. Look for them, look for the schools, look for the colored schools. Those are anchor institutions, okay? You wanna know the terms. Now, it's good that we're trying to be more PC 
And, you know, if you call somebody a Negro, that's fighting words at this point. But as historians and researchers, we have to know these historical terms because these were the terms that were used to describe our ancestors at certain points in time. So where somebody is like, oh, we don't need to have anything colored listed in the catalog or whatever. I'm like, no, leave it in. Because when I see colored, I'm thinking a certain time frame. When I'm seeing Afro-American, that's like the 70s on, you know? So those different terms represent, represent a certain time frame in our history. So as researchers, you have to be familiar with those terms. You have to know we were Afro-American, we were Black, we were the N-word, we were winches, we were free men, free women, we were slaves, we were all of this stuff. We were colored. Colored is a big one. It's, it stayed around for a long time. But you need to know these terms. We were free people of color. So as researchers, you have to gird yourself against some of the stuff you're going to see. Because the term, I mean, the tone that is used the terminology that is used, it might make you feel a certain kind of way. So I'm just telling you, be prepared to get mad. But when you get mad, turn that mad, that anger into energy to go looking, to go find the truth. OK, so just know that we're in, we're in the South. Everything was segregated down to where they put our deceased bodies down to who took care of our bodies. And it's still that way now. If you go to Lithonia, there's a black funeral home, there's a white funeral home. If a black person go to the white one, guess what they gonna do? You need to go to that one. Yeah, but it still, it still happens. Huh? Yeah. But just keep that in mind, okay? There are color books. So when you're looking at marriage books, tax digest, there are color books or there might be colored sections. Newspapers for the longest time, like between 1920s to about the 1960s, the Atlanta Constitution, Atlanta Journal, and the AJ, well, the AJC later on. But the Constitution had a colored obituary section. So you got to keep that in mind when you're looking for information. Look for the asterisk. Look for COL. COL apostrophe or yeah, apostrophe D or C. Military draft cards, they got a clipped in. That lets you know that, that that person is colored at a glance, okay? At least for World War I. You want to look at the table of contents. You want to look at the introduction. You also want to check the index because you got to think about these historical works. Who wrote them? There are going to be times when they tell you up front they did not include African-Americans or black people in this volume. They may talk about the history of the county and only have a paragraph about the Negro community. The Warren County History Book actually had a whole chapter. I was surprised. Mm -hmm. But just keep that in mind and also look in the back of the book, because like with Tax Digest, the earlier ones, they had the white taxpayers in the front. The consolidation page was the, the um, dividing line. After that, they had the colored taxpayers. So you have to keep all this stuff in mind. So, know before you come, we've gone through the prep work. So this is the Georgia Archives website. We just revamped it, so it looks a little different. So the top part, you'll see our contact information. You'll see our hours of operation. You'll also see our social media. So as Robin said earlier, if you follow, um, if you are a part of the social media platforms, please follow us. I was happy to see that our YouTube went from 997 to over a thousand. So we hit a thousand subscribers. So if y'all are not following us on YouTube, please do so because those numbers speak volume. So one section I want to highlight is visit and programs. And this information is outlined in some of your handouts. The reason why I want to highlight this is because of three areas. One, online exhibits, two, past presentations, and three, the presentation handouts and slides. So under online exhibits, there are several exhibits there, one of which you might be interested in, primary sources that document enslaved and free persons of color. 
And also, if you're like me, you have trouble reading that early handwriting, they have one of those as well. Mm -hmm. Our YouTube page, and I have to give props to Robin. She has organized it very well. So there are um, different hate playlists on different topics. And so I have to give props to Penny who helped build it. And so Robin has stood on her shoulders to continue that process. And one um, resource I really want to highlight was done by my colleague, Allison Hudgens. And so one of the great things about what has happened since the pandemic with us is that we have recorded our, video, our, our sessions. So I'm being recorded right now. So if you miss something, you can go back next week or next two weeks and see this over. Not that you might not want to listen to me again, but hey, there's a lot of programs on there. Um, I will sit there and listen to them myself. But I wanted to highlight this one specifically because she talks a great deal about court records and she goes into the history of Georgia courts. So definitely take a look at that. And I put this up here just so you guys can make sure you can see it and find it. And you should start about an hour or three because I have a session before that, but I really wanted to highlight hers. So, yeah. So going down to three presentations. So when you click on programs, oh, start, I'm sorry. When you click on visit and then programs, you'll see this page, but you can scroll to the bottom. And when you scroll to the bottom, you'll see these resources. And I wanted to highlight this because Kayla, our previous deputy director, did a really great session on slave laws at one point, and the slides are listed there. So if you're interested in the slave laws of Georgia, this is a great resource. So from our homepage, this is the bottom of our homepage. There is a section called Research Guidance and there's Virtual Vault. Why didn't I put the slide in and talked about Research Guidance? Okay. We'll pull it up later so you guys can see it. But you see at the bottom right there on the right where it says vital records. So remember how I said there's a handout about vital records. That's the place where it's housed. OK. So the virtual vault is our digital collection home. It is a portal of some of our more, most important historical documents from 1733 to the present. It even has the charter. It has the constitutions. It has a lot of stuff there. And so it has a total of 53 collections right now. It's growing, 33 of which are keyword searchable. The other 21, that's the, the other 20, I, that's a typo. The other 20 are browsable. So amongst the collections are collections of photographs like Vanishing Georgia, which is the largest one, which includes photographs like these. The one on the left is like my absolute favorite photograph because it's of an uh, African-American family circa 1885. But the other photograph I found the other day is of Dr. Joseph Winthrop Holly and Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. These are two educators who founded, respectively, Al Albany State University and Bethune-Cookman College. The virtual law also includes military records and also county and state records. But just know that it's not all online. So we all know that, right? So the thing about online records is to think of them as dangling carrots. We want to give you a taste of what we have, but we really want you to come on site so that you can see all the other stuff that we have. So one way that you can find resources that we have in-house is our book and manuscript collection, um, book and manuscript catalog. And this is the homepage for that. And I wanted to illustrate a couple of things. So you remember how I mentioned the terminology. The thing about our resources is that based off of the titles of the materials, if you search for African-American and then you search for a different term, you're going to get different search results total, okay? Because of the terminology, terminology that is used by the materials. So this is African-American. And there are 268 results, okay? But I searched for Negro. When I searched for Negro, 
I got 131. So that's why it's important to search all of these various terms because we are a historical institution. We're trying to keep up and process new stuff that's coming in. We can't really go back and start changing all the terminology all to African-American. There's no way. So as a researcher, you have to cross all your um, T's, dot all your I's, and use all of those terms to search for information. So when you're looking at collections using a book and manuscript, one part of that is the manuscript collection. And you'll know it's the manuscript collection because you will see the collection at the top that lets you know that that's a manuscript collection, okay? You also know that when you see manuscripts and you see like an eight digit number and M, that's what's called an accession number or a consignment number. Think of it as like the call number for a book, like a call number that they use for books. So once you find that, you actually want to scroll down and look at the details because with the collections, what we try to do is we try to give you a description of it. So this collection, came up because this is an account book for the Negroes who are sharecropping on this property. So the thing you also want to pay attention to is at the bottom, the physical description. So what we try to do is we try to give you an idea about how big this collection is. So ours is in cubic feet. So it's a quarter cubic feet. But if you see like 160 cubic feet, that's 160 banker boxes. So if you have a collection that has a large cubic feet number, just be prepared that you're gonna be spending a lot of time at the archives, okay? So in addition to the manuscript collection, we have the books. And it's approximately 30,000. Family genealogies, genealogy how-tos, military records, there's a ton of information there. With the family genealogies, we do have a few African-American ones like this one, Two Trees Standing. The best way to find the family genealogies is to look in the manuscript catalog or the book and manuscript catalog and search by surname. Because we know surnames appear in multiple trees, right? So that's the best way to find the surname in these books. But it is organized alphabetically by surname. We also have what I call the county and city range, where we have county print resources, and they're organized alphabetically by county. And so this is one of the books that is included in that. It's one of the books written by Michael Thurman, who is the current DeKalb County CEO, and he will be here next week on the 9th. So if you get a chance to come out, please do so. There are also secondary sources that can also help you locate your people because maybe some historian was focusing on a certain area that your family lived, sort of kind of like Drums and Shadows, which deals with the Georgia Coastal Negroes. So maybe your family were Georgia Coastal Negroes. So guess what you do? You go grab this book so you can learn what the author wrote about. We also have periodicals and journals that include several African-American publications. This is an example of the title. So we do have the Augs Journals, the Augs News. We also have the GGSQ, which is the Georgia Geological Society, Society Quarterly. We also have the GHQ, which is the publication done by the Georgia Historical Society. We also have some issues of the Journal of Negro History. And in that journal, I found this very interesting article, A Slave Family in Athenbellum South. And I'm trying to remember what year is this. So this is 1975. So I found that, and this is what was in there. Can you imagine finding one of these for your family members? That would be so cool, right? I'm a tad bit jealous, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. That's We're working towards that. So manuscript collections are private papers that have been donated to the archives. So these are individuals, these are organizations. And so we have some on microfilm, but we also have some in original records. And so you would use the book and manuscript catalog to locate those. 
We are currently in the process of adding the manuscript collection to our finding aids, which is where we have our government records um, searching uh, functionality. And I'm sorry, we're adding the manuscript catalog, the manuscript collections to the resource that we use to search our government records. So they'll all be in one place, but it's a work in progress because we are few in number, but we get a lot done. So these are some examples of some resources in the manuscript collections. And these are some examples that I took from the virtual vault. This is our resource to help you locate government records, government original records. And so it's called Finding Aids and it's located on our homepage as well. So when you're looking for original documents, you wanna think who created them, who produced them. So if I'm thinking education, what department am I looking for? Department of Education, right? If I'm looking for street maps, what department am I looking for? Department of Transportation. So when you're researching archives, in addition to looking by topic, by, by individual, also think what agency may have produced these records. And so like with education, we have the Negro Education Division records. So remember that term, you got to utilize all of them. So we also have in our microfilm room, we have files. We have a family surname file. And on the back of the folded handout is the listing of all of the surnames that are separated out for the Black genealogy surname file. So this is grandfathered in. So we don't recognize that or acknowledge that or follow that right now, but historically it was pulled out and separated. So it's the first range, so it's only one drawer. So if you're looking for surname files, you wanna check both the black one and you also wanna check the main. There are church and cemetery files, subject files, as well as pamphlets. Pamphlets are just that if we put them on a the shelf, they'll get lost. So we just put them in um, a file cabinet. Yes, ma'am. The question was, are the church and cemetery files court, um, organized by county? They are. So you will look for the county first and then you'll look inside, but it doesn't include all the churches, doesn't include all the cemeteries. That is just material that has been donated to us over the years. Yes, ma'am. I'm at time. Okay, I'm gonna keep going because we got a few minutes. All right, so microfilm collection, a lot of these um, indexes have been added to the virtual vault, just so you know, but we do have over 30,000. <clears> and so there are several different um, collections that are listed there. So please make sure to visit us to see. But I wanted to pull this one out. We've talked a little bit about the Digital Library of Georgia. There was a publication that was done that actually lists the microfilm records that are focused on African Americans. And so this is available full text on DLG. And this is an example of it. I know you guys can't see it. I blew it up a little bit. But there's one down at Orgathorpe. Let me see if I can pull this up a little bit. So marriage licenses issued to Freedmen. That's definitely something to look at if you're looking at Orgathorpe County. And so when you're looking at this resource, the first line or the first column is the drawer number. The second column is the box number. All right. So we're not just Georgia resources. We do have resources on various states, some of which are listed here. Research tips. We talked a little bit about this. We talked extensively about this, so I'm not going to rehash a lot of this stuff. But just know <clears throat> if you have questions, we have on our website and ask an archivist. It was that blue box under our um, information about our operation, operating hours. Click on that and it will take you to another page to click on the form and you can ask us questions there. We cannot do your research for you, but we can help guide you to the resources that may be available to assist you. And that's just some additional resources. And I'm going through the slides just so you'll have them on the recording. 
So most people who have been to my presentations know I like to give homework. So this one is no different. So you can do one or all, and it's really simple. Just want you to visit the Georgia Archives website, scroll to the bottom, click on research guidance. Look at those research help guides because they are very informative. I've actually read them myself and I utilize them often. Go to our programs page, take a look at one of the online exhibits, go down to the program video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and review the slides of one of the programs and see if you can find an actual program in the listing. Go to the vault, the virtual vault and explore its contents. And that's it. Happy honey, your family is waiting. <laughs>
him seeing that term possibly in our records because that's on an official government document. I wrote it out. I didn't even say it to him because I know how it feels to, you know, I don't want nobody to say the N word to me. I don't care what context, don't say it, say N word. So I wanted to show him that same respect. So when we're in this space, we as information gatekeepers, we have to check ourselves sometimes because there's some research I'll be doing. I'll be doing. I'm sorry, y'all. My professional wisdom went out the door. My bad. But when you're doing this research, yeah, you're right. It is. When you're doing this research, we as information gatekeepers, the archivists, we have to keep in mind about our emotional responses. Derek, who was here, Auburn Avenue has a full-fledged clan outfit in their collection. I saw it and I'm like, holy crap. I'm like feeling all sorts of emotions. But guess what we have to do when we're information gatekeepers, historians, if we're in these institutions, we have to put self aside to help the researchers. There have been situations here, and I can say that because we family, right? My boss ain't in here, so I can say it. There have been situations here where I myself as an archivist have had to prepare to assist people who may feel a certain kind of way about me personally. It's funny sometimes when people come up to me and I'm at the desk and they're looking for Confederate ancestry and I think they are afraid to come ask me. But I'm like, no, let's go because I want to I want to learn because that's my job. So I put aside stuff like people at GGS know. And some people had some other, like I talked to them, uh, Robin about this. I want a class on how to find my Confederate ancestors, not mine personally. Because guess what? That's a part of the Georgia narrative. So if we research in Georgia, we got to have the good, the bad, the ugly, and the unbelievable. Because that's a part of the narrative. So I'm getting off my soapbox. I'm going to answer his question. Then I'm going to get down. Yes, sir. Right. So say that again. So you're looking for information about them? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's not an area that I'm familiar with. So you can ask, do a ask an archivist, and we'll try to find the information about that. But the thing about that is knowing about the treatment of your ethnicity that you're researching. So you got to understand what's the time frame because they weren't nice to people from who, from Irish. They weren't, some at some points in time, it wasn't nice or sexy to be Irish, to be Italian. And we know the Native Americans, you know, that just makes me cry every time I do research. So you have to be familiar with the treatment of the ethnic group or religious group in the place where you're researching at that certain time so that you can understand the environment. So then you can figure out how are they listed what terms were used to describe them and try to find as much information as you can. That's a new one. I haven't heard that. So that will be interesting to explore. Okay. I guess we can do one more question because I don't see Josh. Yes, ma'am. by it, they won't acknowledge it. Yeah. And if we join together, my hand, that's the way my cousin it. And, and I felt really grateful because I was nervous that they would hate me, you know. And um, and I will say, like researching these, um, I get really angry with my ancestors and want to, you know, hate these people. But sometimes we think it. And I'm like, how can you enslave a four-year-old, two-year-old, a nine-month-old, and what, you know? But, um, yeah, so I think along with the terms, which there's awful terms written, mm -hmm. that like we just come at it today together and say, that was awful. It was wrong. But let's leave together. Let's have you know um, your family is and they're amazing people. So the thing about it is, 
and I promise to get off my soapbox, <laughs> is that there are people who are afraid, afraid of learning that their ancestors were slaveholders. We know about Ben Affleck and the whole finding your roots fiasco, right? We were, um, they were filming, uh, who do you think you are downstairs? And the young lady who was being interviewed, she was so happy that she, they didn't find, I think it was that she didn't have any enslavers in her ancestry. And she was like, did you hear that? Did you hear that? She was all excited. So what I've learned in teaching these classes is that there are some individuals, white people, who are afraid of know knowing that, and they're ashamed. But that goes back to that whole 21st century mindset on a 19th century situation. I started adding, you have to create a no judgment zone for your ancestors, because I got murderers, I got bootleggers in my family. And so my great grandmother, Bessie, she was a bootlegger, but guess what? She was a hustler. She took care of her family. So she was an entrepreneur. So you have to think about it from a different perspective. So I'm being for real. So it depends on how you shape it, because guess what? Even though they were enslavers, they came so that you could be, because without them, you would not be here. So whether or not they were good slaveholders, bad slaveholders, they had slaves, they didn't have slaves, they were enslaved, they weren't enslaved. When you look at history, because we're living in crazy history right now, but when you look at history overall, they overcame all of them so that you could be here to tell their story. So whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's ugly or unbelievable, guess what? You got to tell that story. Because if we don't tell the stories, what happens? We lose that history. They're not telling certain stories in schools. When you're in the state of Georgia and they can't teach about Dr. King and he was born here, come on now. All right, I got to get off before I lose my job. All right, bye, y'all.